So first up, I'd just like to introduce uh, Rodri Lloyd, who is a reader at pediatric, in Pediatric Strength and Conditioning at Cardiff Met University, world leader and authority in youth athlete development, taking a look at the ups and downs of developing young athletes. So just welcome to the stage, Rodri. Uh, morning, everyone. Um, and uh, just to sort of uh, echo the words here, you know, it's a, a huge thanks to um, to Ben and to Kev for inviting me um, all the way from Cardiff. Uh, nice little train journey, but um, the hospitality, uh, the welcome has been first class. And um, you know, in the a sort of similar field in terms of trying to um, produce some applied research, um, you know, it's been pretty. Uh, inspiring to see what what Ben and Kev have grown here, um, and I think there's a you know a long sort of tradition now of uh, of they're producing some really good students, doing some really good stuff. So I'm I'm really humbled to have been asked to to come and present. And strictly speaking, um, if people were uh, hoping for some sort of Ronan Keaton pun, uh, there's not one in here. Um, but you may well be singing the song in your head right now. Um, but strictly speaking. Um, the, the reason that um, we sort of are going to go down this, this path today is that when we think of training kids, um, and, and as a bit of a caveat, you know, we're not a sort of a, a rugby research group as such, we're probably a little broader than that. Um, but, but really when we're, we're working with children, you know, there's, there's some real certain key things and key messages that we need to be aware of that, you know, we understand and we respect the fact that they are a unique population. Um, and sometimes when we are looking at objective data and lots of these markers, we actually forget the, the crux of this. Um, you know, some of these younger athletes are, are kids still. So uh, just a quick bit about us, because uh, hopefully it'll help to paint a little bit of a picture. This is our um, uh, facility. This is our training center here. And we have a, um, a research lab that's housed next door, which looks a little like this. Um, and we run an after school program so we have a range of different athletes coming in. Um, so I said, we, we have had rugby teams come through, um, but we also have rowing, we have tennis and, and gymnastics and so on. Um, and really, I feel a bit embarrassed about being the one up on the stage here because there's a, a huge team back in Cardiff that um, are really productive and, and do some great things. Um, and then we're also lucky that we've sort of built, a, I guess, a collaborative network then with some, some people internationally um, that really help drive our, our research questions. So um, it's part of a, certainly part of a team. So why do we need to know about this? Um, well, this is uh, possibly not the best uh, example of youth sport. Um, and actually, if you, if you track this one down on social media and you listen to the, uh, the voiceover, um, it's, it's hilarious in terms of the, uh, the enthusiasm that the parents and coaches have from the sidelines. Um, and I'm not someone who bash, goes around bashing sport parents, um, but this really isn't quite a good example. And really, you know, if we look at this and we need to try and work out, whilst it's really fun that his team are winning all the time, if we think of the holistic development of the kids um, who are playing in that game, it's probably not what we'd be looking for, yeah? And we're also, from our team, uh, we're interested in developing physical fitness. So this is Sylvia, one of our PhD students. Um, so this is going to be our practical later on today. Um, but strictly speaking, you know, if uh, Sylvia has started a PhD, she's well underway, actually. Um, and one of her challenges is really unique to gymnastics, is whether or not we can actually enhance physical fitness above what they're going to gain from competing in their sport. Um, just, you know, through the, the weekly exposure to those sorts of training modalities. But we're also in, uh, interested in reducing injury risk. Um, that's where we've come with some of our research. If you look at number 11 here, is there something that we can do about trying to reduce the chances of that happening? Um, and the data is pretty compelling now. Um, and we've done, some, we've done some work around that. But there's a huge body of work that's looked into, um, into injury in youth sport. Um, there's some things and there's some trends that are, are coming out um, that we need to be aware of. And then we're also interested in trying to change policy um, to ensure that, that correct prescription is adhered to, and that's probably not correct drop height for that kid. Um, 
but that's essentially like us doing a drop jump from the ceiling here. We're not going to rebound off the floor. Um, and there's a few things that go wrong with this photo, this video, but um, we won't delve into all of those. Um, but that's not good practice, eh? And then, um, I promise you this is my wife's magazine. I don't buy these uh, trashy mags, but um, I couldn't help when I saw this one. Um, this is uh, all the best intentions, but probably a bit misplaced. Um, so when you actually look at, take a look at it, it looks good. You know, the kids are doing some strength stuff. That's cool. But then when you delve into it and you have a little look at read around some of the subject material, it's pretty clear that um, the goals of these parents are a little bit misplaced. So actually, you know, the, the, the kid not wanting to do it, you know, um, is punished for being lazy. Um, they actually have to shred down and check out their abs when it's coming up to competition time. And, you know, when you look at that, as a, as a researcher, you look at that as a coach, but you look at as a parent, um, that's not easy to see, you know, easy to read about. And in the far end extreme, um, hopefully some of our work will, as I said, in, influence policy. Um, and this happened in, uh, in a university in Denver. Um, so this was a cheerleading youth team, um, and the, the coach was, was struck off. Um, probably should have been struck in the face, but um, you, you, know, you look at this and completely inappropriate. So there was a, a string of the athletes from this um, training camp that ended up in hospital. Um, they had connective tissue injuries and, and you name it. So that's the, um, I guess the serious side. Um, and then in terms of Wales, we, we do the best in terms of, a, I guess, a smaller nation. Um, and in the Commonwealth recently, this was a, a girl who was picked to, to travel. She's 11 years of age. Um, and I have mixed feelings about it. Uh, because actually when you have that, that child and, you know, she has setbacks along the way, is she going to be really prepared at the age of 11 to, to withstand that? And when you look at the statement that she gave in the press, then it kind of sets a picture for us, well... Are we pushing athletes down a path too soon? You know, is it okay that we have an 11-year-old who comes home to rest for 10 or 20 minutes? Yeah. So in terms of looking at workload, and I know that, um, that Ben and, and Kev have got some students who've been looking at training load, um, then it's, you know, it's something that we really do need to be, we need, need to be mindful of because from a, an overall stress on that child, if we're giving them too much workload too soon, and we look at some of the data that's coming out from um, sports specialization research, we can actually be setting them up to fail later on. So, we look at nonlinear development, and um, strictly speaking, this is a, a big thing for us, for our research, in ensuring that we are very cognizant of the fact that kids do not develop in a, a straight, uniform, linear fashion. And that's the same for um, multiple systems, so not just from a, a somatic um, perspective in terms of their, their overall size and stature, but from the internal subsystems within the body. But we know if we look at the, um, the data around stature, um, we'll have this marker here. So we have childhood, we have adolescence, and PHV, which is referred to quite a bit in our research and the research of many others, uh, in terms of that period where you have the greatest rate of change in, um, in stature. And our research has kind of tried to delve into the question of what happens when we have athletes of different maturity status, because we know that maturity changes and differs between individuals from a timing perspective, but also a tempo and a magnitude perspective. So the question is, if we have a group of 12-year-olds and we know that biologically that they can vary up to sort of five years maybe from a biological standpoint, then is it right that we are training them in terms of the training stimulus that we provide um, across a group? And it's inherently difficult, right? And I'm acutely aware of the fact that for lots of sports still, it's age group classifications. But I think there is a move, certainly, um, in talking to coaches that are involved with sort of soccer academies, um, rugby academies, there's definitely a, a move towards trying to accommodate for these variations in biological stature. So here we have a, an early 
Um, uh, an early developer, we have a late developer here, and we can see a big spread of these within a given chronological age group. So the question is, how do we go about trying to determine how mature someone is? All right, so a lot of our work, earlier work, I suppose, looked at um, the, the Mirrorwald equation in terms of trying to predict a time point away from peak height velocity. So when we take that, that cross-sectional analysis, uh, probably more, more likely with this sort of um, method, you know, if we've got that marker and we can then calculate the, the time from peak height velocity, we get an indication of where that child is um, or adolescent is in terms of their biological development. And then, as I'll show you now in terms of some of the, uh, the, the research that we've carried out, but others have carried out also, can we get, try and get a little bit cute with what we actually prescribe from a training stimulus to take advantage of what is going on from a natural development standpoint, okay? So with this marker, as I said, we can, we can group accordingly. The, the, um, the original paper, there's a, an error rate of around about half a year. So we need to try and factor that into our analysis. So if we're looking at cross-sectional data, something that we do is actually we try and take out a, a half year interval either side of that plus or, or minus 0 0.5 and then that will give us a hopefully a, a reduced risk of someone being misplaced into either of those um, in either of those categories but the greatest accuracy uh, of the equation is able to identify kids who are around that circa PHV um, time point the further away we go in terms of a time the less accurate the the equation becomes okay but strictly speaking um, you know the the original research was actually published to really try and identify those who are pre and those who are post um, with that we can identify kids in terms of the bands and then we can try and uh, what well, some of our researchers looked at you know the the training responsiveness when kids are in each of one of these different types of bands okay now um, there are people out there who will have um, question and critique this method um, due to the error and due to the fact that age is actually one of the component variables that goes into the equation um, but I think for its usage across uh, the fit within the field and some of the data that's been published off the back of it it still has a place one thing that we've now moved to um, is that we actually now use predicted adult height as well so percentage of predicted adult height so not just looking at whether someone is plus one or minus one, but then actually trying to factor in how close are they to their eventual uh, end stage height, their predicted uh, adult height. Because we could actually have um, you know, two kids who are of the same height, but one still has much further to go before they actually reach that, that end height. Now that might be useful in terms of talent ID and potentially explaining some um, discrepancies within your data when you're looking at um, squad analyses. So with that in mind, um, if you look at the data, we can actually pull it around. PHV normally takes place around about 92% of predicted adult height. So from a research standpoint, in terms of trying to then apply it to practice, we can actually sort of say, well, look, our PHV marker, our, our, our maturity offset is coming out at minus one. We see that the kid is 85% of their predicted adult height we're pretty confident now, or we're more confident that that, that athlete is indeed pre-PHV. Okay, so it's a way that we can almost um, uh, second guess in terms of the, the quality of our assessments. With predicted adult height, um, there is a, a slight change then that we have a, a circupubertal and a mid-late pubertal with a, a slight greater range. So that's almost like what, how we would go about doing it. Um, and I think a, you know, a, a take home here is is that growth and maturity and understanding the influence of growth and maturity on physical fitness development, on injury risk, um, on a movement quality becomes important for us. Um, it's not the main thing, but it is an important quality that we need to take account for. So what happens from our point of view, the way we think about it from a research standpoint at Cardiff Met, is we try and do some research into, yes, we want to know about the training responsiveness, but we also want to know what happens if we don't do anything? You know, what if we just let kids develop naturally because they will actually then be our sort of reference, our control group data. So this is one of our um, staff and uh, PhD students, John uh, Radner, um, and he's looking at 
essentially looking at muscle architecture and how that changes over the course of childhood and into adolescence. Because believe it or not, it's really, really hard to find any, any literature out there that's looked at muscle architectural changes across those time frames. We were really surprised that we went to the literature. Um, so he pulled together a bit of a review and he's looked at some of the things that will change um, from a structural point of view, but then also from, a, I guess, a, a neural side, and then how that might influence when we see these natural changes in um, a kid's ability to jump or a kid's ability to sprint. Because yeah, actually, sometimes we do nothing with them, they actually get better anyway. Yeah, so it's a really uh, easy way to be a good S&C coach. Yeah, but um, with that information in mind, um, we then start to delve into looking at stuff a little bit more empirically. Um, so this was Rob Mayers, who was a, again a staff member, he's completed his PhD, and he looked at changes in spatiotemporal characteristics during sprinting, and how they changed um, across a 21 month period. So in this data set we had kids who were initially pre-peak height velocity and they stayed within that band. Then we also had kids within this, the sample that were initially pre-peak height velocity and then entered into post-peak height velocity. So we had that, that shift. And what we see here from the data, um, we saw things like sprint times in, uh, improved. We saw um, in terms of the, I guess, the kinematics and the, the stride characteristics in terms of um, stride frequency, stride length, there were changes. But interestingly for us, when we look at these, some of these measures, we have relative stiffness, we have relative leg stiffness, we have relative peak force. And these are all things that we can actually influence from a training point of view. And we know that they actually ended up explaining quite a large uh, proportion of changes in sprint times in this, po in, the, in this sample. And these were just school kids. These weren't athletes, if you'd like to call them that. They were just regular school kids. So if these factors are coming out as explaining you know, a pretty good proportion of that overall function, then you know, it would sort of stand to reason that they would be things that we would probably be um, well placed to start training. So then we're interested in, in, in developing physical fitness. So what happens if we do nothing? What happens if we actually intervene? And um, we phrased, uh, coined a term, synergistic adaptation. And, and really this is, the crux behind this is, is actually can we try and align the training stimulus to the stimulus that the kids are experiencing just through growth and maturation? With the rationale being, if we can actually mar marry those up, do we get a better training response? So have a look, a little, uh, a look at a little bit of the data here. This was a, um, a systematic review that um, uh, some guys down in AUT um, published. And, and here's some data to show, I guess, the effectiveness of different training modes when we group kids according to those biological stages. So here what we can see is when we get the pre-peak height velocity group, that plyometric training served to be a really potent stimulus to get gains in, in sprint times. Okay, and then as we get to more of a post-peak height velocity, we see that combined training becomes a little bit more of a, of a, um, uh, a sensitive training stimulus. And with combined training, we mean sort of um, strength and plyometric training. So when we think back to what's happening from a, a, a natural development standpoint, when we have these pre-PHV kids, we have a lot of neural changes. That's really what's driving adaptation. You know, we see kids get stronger or faster. It's not necessarily because they're getting huge increases in muscle size, but the quality of that muscle in terms of its neuromuscular functioning is improving. When we get through peak height velocity, um, and we probably more so when we get to sort of peak weight velocity, that's when we see real more structural changes coming into play and becoming more of an influence. Yeah, so we would think then that that combined approach might be targeting those, um, those sorts of natural adaptations. Interestingly, uh, there's very little research done um, until Jason Moran has done some, um, uh, some nice work, which we'll briefly look at here. But there isn't actually a, a huge amount of evidence of sprint training studies, like just allowing kids to sprint. Um, and uh, ironically, you know, the best way you can actually get someone faster, if you look at the literature, is by, by allowing them to run fast. That serves as a, as a potent stimulus. Um, there's actually a review article that came out last year by Michael Rumpf, and it shows it. You know, you get your greatest return when you expose your athletes to sprint training modalities. Um, 
Go figure. Uh, so, with that in mind, uh, so this is uh, some of Jason's work, and uh, this is actually an empirical study. So inter instead of trying to pull or, um, I guess, infer these uh, ideas based off the literature, this was an empirical study that was published this year. And uh, when we actually look at the, uh, they had experimental and control groups, and we look at the data, we see that the pre-PHV kids made much more favorable changes to the sprint training modality. So this was an eight-week study from memory, eight-week study once a week. Uh, I think it was sort of 16 times 20 meters with rest in between. Um, so it sort of begs the question, well, do we get a greater return now with these younger kids if we give them a very neurally charged type training stimulus? Okay, so from a sprinting perspective, it would sort of suggest that we can get returns whether their kid is pre or post, but it may be that we get a, um, a slightly augmented um, response with the earlier kids. And we've done some um, research as well, published some research that has looked at a similar sort of component. Um, and this looked at the, the effects of different types of training modes in kids. Um, so we had a, a plyometric group, we had a strength group, we had a combined plyometric and strength group, and then we had a control group that just followed the regular PE curriculum. And uh, you know, what our data showed is actually when we looked at some between group differences here, when we exposed the pre-PHV kids to the plyometric training, we actually see very likely um, uh, changes in terms of acceleration and squat jump performance. And actually, the, the specific response here in terms of why didn't we see that being translated to 20 meter sprint type, the flying 20 meters in RSI, probably because of the nature of the program. It was probably a slightly more concentrically dominant, I guess. So again, it's starting to sort of show this evidence of synergistic adaptation. And then John published some, some data off uh, trying to look at the individual responses, because I think that's really important when we look at training studies, is that we try and factor in wherever possible the individual response so that we are not masked by group means, um, that we try and look at, at the individual response level. And we can see here in terms of uh, those who made changes above that smallest worthwhile change, we actually see a, you know, a good response here from those kids who have pre-peak height velocity. Um, but then actually when we go to the combined training, it paints a slightly different story and suggests that, do you know what? The combined training is probably going to be effective for both. You know, whether we've got kids who are pre or post PHV, they probably need to be exposed to a variation in terms of their training. Yeah, so give them the strength stuff, give them the, um, the plyometric type training. And you're probably sitting there thinking, well, yeah, I, I do that all the time, <laughs> you know? Um, but this is hopefully validating some, some of the practice that we would typically engage with. And uh, for us, I suppose, we've had a, um, within the group, we've had a real focus on speed, power, strength in terms of our outcome variables. We're probably less accustomed with, um, uh, or sorry, less interested, I suppose, in terms of some of the aerobic type um, changes that we see from training. Um, and I, I always cite this paper. Um, so this is a, a 2016 paper that was published in British Journal of Sports Medicine. Um, and you know, they looked at the effectiveness, I guess, of strength training in, in young athletes. So this was not your school kids. Um, these were, I guess, people that were involved in some sort of young athletic program. And in terms of trying to get strength gains, this is what the, the, uh, the study found, is that when we, in order to get the, the greatest achievements in terms of performance enhancement, we need that program to run more than 23 weeks. Um, and that's probably one of the failings, being brutally honest with you with some of the, the kids-based training studies, is that they're not long enough. And sometimes to realize the adaptations, we need longer time. Yeah, so I tend to go by the motto of, um, of, you know, don't flash fry them, slow cook them, you know, and, and build them up over a, a long period of time. Um, so we're moving now towards some sort of year-long training studies. And I think we should have the courage you know, to, to publish our annual plans as part of those papers, you know, and really tell the reader that this is what we did and these are the outcomes that we got from it. Sometimes I think we're 
granted limited by word counts of papers, but we really need to try and give uh, a true insight. And for me, the, the, the major uh, take home from this paper is this one, intensity. And probably for the history uh, and the tradition around kids doing strength training or kids being involved in high intensity type training, there have been some concerns. And please do not think I'm standing here telling you, <laughs> suggesting you just go and um, you know, train your guys like, like animals without a care in the world, all right? But it is important that we push a training intensity element. So if kids are, d are demonstrating good quality movement, then we should be putting additional load on. And we shouldn't be, sh we should be frightened of that, okay? Because ultimately we're all good coaches and we should be viewing and we should be making those sorts of decisions on, on, uh, in terms of what we see in front of us. But the intensity seems to be a really important marker, yeah? There's a caveat, and this is my, uh, my get-out clause in case I'm sued, uh, is that in that paper, the, the final take-home here is that the competency of the athlete remains paramount. And we absolutely agree with that. Um, but hopefully over time, you know, we build the competency, we build the load. And um, uh, just hot off the press, uh, so this is Sylvia, her reliability paper's just been um, uh, accepted in, in JASA now. One of the problems we've had and we've, we've tried to battle with over the years has been how do you get a good strength assessment of these kids, especially if they're coming into you and the argument is they don't have any technical competency, okay? Um, so what we did, she's, her PhD is uh, in gymnasts. So we had uh, uh, six-year-olds, as young as six-year-olds, and they performed an isometric mid-thigh pull. Um, so they were on uh, ground fixed uh, force plates there, um, dual plate system. Um, and we showed some, some decent stats coming off the back of it. So peak force was pretty, um, was pretty reliable, both within the session and between sessions. So we were looking at CVs of around about sort of 8%, 9%. Um, and that's uh, in terms of the, the applicability of that value, we would really expect to see changes in peak force far in excess of that noise as a result of a training study and or growth and maturation. So that paper there had a pre and a post peak height velocity split. So um, for us, this is something that will form part of all of our testing moving forwards. Um, and when we think there is some, we need to run a probably a validity study on the, uh, the relationship between the mid five pull and maybe some 1RM type stuff with some more advanced kids. But certainly there's some adult data that we can lean on um, to show that there is a, a pretty tight correlation between those two. So as a summary point then, we'd sort of uh, go down the line that that childhood period seems to be really, really important. Um, Yes, granted, we are not going to get this, the, potentially the magnitude of change, especially from a strength perspective, as we might in the adolescence. But in terms of um, you know, making worthwhile improvements and the multifactorial benefits of getting those kids stronger, um, that is a, a, a ripe time to do it. And in terms of the plasticity associated with that, um, with that age group, you know, it becomes really important that we lay the foundations during those early years in terms of the neuromuscular efficiency, um, you know, the way that neural system is, um, is wired up, so to speak. We might need to be wary of peak height velocity and adolescent awkwardness, um, and you know, really factor in that we might see a reduction in, in coordination around that time. So we might see you know, a, a player demonstrating some sort of decrement in performance and it's not necessarily because they're not working hard, it's possibly because they're experiencing that, um, you know, the, the heights of that growth spurt. And then certainly when we get into um, post-peak height velocity, you know, if we've done a good job, and in an ideal world, if we get the kids in early and we take them through that path and they don't just turn up on our books at age 15, then, you know, they'll have a really good training history behind them and then you can actually try and ramp up the, the training load in that period. Okay. Um, we'll skip that one. So, in terms of uh, injury risk, this is our, um, uh, another direction that we've sort of been trying to, to delve into. Um, 
you'd probably be better off jumping online and trying to watch Paul, uh, put, this is Paul Reaver, my PhD students, uh, get online and he's got an Aspatar video where he goes through all of his, his uh, PhD data and he's, um, he's a super smart guy. Um, and, and he's done some work where he looked at uh, uh, injury uh, risk in, for lower limb injury risk in um, English, uh, English soccer academies. And uh, it tells a nice story because Paul, bless him, he had ACL injuries when he was younger. He was a footballer and it's all come together for him to do a, a PhD on the topic. But this was a, an interesting paper that, that he published, uh, I think it was last year. Um, and what we were able to show is Back in 2004, there was um, an injury audit um, within the FA, all the academies, and there was an injury rate of 0.4 injuries per player per year. That was sort of the, the take-home strap line. And um, granted on a slightly smaller sample size, but the, it's a, a relative marker, I guess, he actually showed that injury rate had increased to 1.32 injuries per player per year. So that was over a period of sort of only 10 to 12 years. In that time, we've had the introduction of EPPP. Um, workloads, I guess, of athletes have gone up. Um, so it, it's something that is a, a bit of a red flag for us um, in terms of, you know, is the training dosage that we're giving these kids the right one, um, both from a volume aspect, but also what we're asking them to do. Yeah, so if it's just a huge amount of soccer type training, with very little attention to actually S and C type type uh, work, you know, are we actually setting them up for um, for injury um, or increasing their chances of injury? I should say. So he's done some published some cross-sectional data as well. First of all, he looked at some um, asymmetry type data, um, and there wasn't really a huge emphasis there. Although there was a slight trend that greater asymmetry was demonstrated around those who were around that sort of peak height velocity marker. Um, he published some stuff around hopping and landing, and sure enough, we see um, a reduced profile, if you like, in terms of in increasing or experiencing greater landing forces around that time of uh, peak height velocity. And then actually, from a, a prospective study where he assessed the kids at the start of the season and then tracked them in terms of injury in incidents throughout, um, maturational offset and advance in age, as well as um, a single leg uh, counter movement jump peak force, they were actually the, the main predictors of injury in the under 13, under 14 age group, which would typically be associated with that, with that um, circa PHV mark. So again, much like the fitness development point of view, it would probably suggest that we might be seeing this sort of synergistic or growth and maturation related changes from an injury risk standpoint as well. And Interestingly, when we look at the effectiveness of your training interventions, um, some of Greg uh, Meyer's work, um, don't worry too much about all the data and so on. If you just look at these boxes here, the black boxes, what it shows is that the effectiveness of your ACL injury prevention programs are, is increased the earlier that kids are exposed to that program. Okay, so this data here looked at early adults and they went down to late teens and mid-teens and that the, the lowest age range they had was around about the sort of 14 mark. So we're hopefully in the next couple of years going to be running a, a study where we actually get, look at um, much younger age groups coming through. Um, but certainly the evidence would suggest, meta-analytical data would suggest that you get greater return the earlier you give that type of investment. Okay. And this was the first sort of, uh, uh, I guess, study of its kind that had really delved into that question. Um, and then I was on the train yesterday uh, and uh, I was alerted to this paper. The timing was perfect. Um, so this has just been published in American Journal of Sports Medicine ahead of print. And uh, sure enough, admittedly only for a bilateral drop jump, what we see here is that we get preferential responses in pre-adolescent versus adolescent groups to the injury risk, uh, the injury prevention program. So there's some different variables that they looked at here in terms of um, uh, peak knee valgus um, and, uh, and kinetics upon landing. So it actually starts to paint a picture that, you know what, it might be that we get real investment, but we get real returns. 
And, you know, whilst the focus for, I guess, performance might start in the adolescent years for some sports, including rugby, um, you know, the question that we should be asking, is there something that we can do, whether it's at a grassroots level, community level, that we try and get some sort of SNC type training into that age group so that we lay the foundation so that we don't spend the first, you know, six to 12 months of those academy years correcting what they should have been doing, you know, in the five, six, seven years previous to that. Yeah, and that's really where, uh, that, that's a, a point that's really going to drive our um, research for the next couple of years. So, um, what does the data show then if we link it back to this roller coaster of growth and maturation? Well, we can expect kids to be more variable in terms of their movement. Okay, we've, we've published a few reliability studies, but if you look at other reliability studies, it says paints the exact same story. You're always going to get higher CVs, you're going to get greater typical errors with younger age groups. They're more variable in terms of their, their movement. Um, but what we see is that when kids then go through this growth spurt and their center of mass is shifted much further away from the ground, um, they're working with longer levers, and we know that strength lags behind height changes through the growth spurt, all of a sudden the kids are being asked to work on a heavier, bigger system, but relatively they are weaker. Yeah, so it's a, a challenge for us, and especially that's even more pronounced in females. Um, you know, the challenge is for making sure that from a training aspect, we are trying to um, account, if you like, for those growth and maturational changes. Um, a bit of a, a red flag here, um, a study a couple of years ago came out, uh, I think it was um, junior soccer players, and 7.2 centimeters of growth in a year was a mark that actually shot, started to see an increased incidence of injury. So that works out at about 0.6 centimeters of growth in a month. So, you know, we would advocate that, that practitioners are collecting data on their athletes, probably on a quarterly basis. Um, I think that's manageable. Um, just to get some heights and stand-in heights on a quarterly basis. If you can do it more often, then great. Um, but quarterly is probably better than not at all. Um, and with that data, we can then sort of start to see if we're seeing those um, meaningful changes in, in, um, in stature. We also see from some rugby data that was published a few years back now in BJSM that moderate to severe injury incidence increases with um, growth and maturation. That, that kind of makes sense because players are much bigger and they run into each other with a greater mass and greater momentum so it's that would stand to reason we probably see more accidental type injuries here but more sort of moderate to severe um, in those older populations so this this concept of integrated training of you know strength plyos balance coordination all that you know it's it's, it's appropriate for all um, but certainly this is a, an important marker for us in terms of getting greater return on investment so tragically, uh, well, tragically, um, uh, I'm not a massive Roald Dahl fan, but my son is. Um, so I was trying to work out, you know, in terms of trying to bring this together, um, you know, uh, name the book. Yes, there we go. I've planted it. Right. So George Marvelous Medicine. So uh, I've just been reading that to him. And uh, it, it's one of the ingredients. So sometimes people have, have um, read stuff that we've published and, or in a conference I come and say, oh, so it's a, it's a, a maturity-based program, is it? So, well, no, it's not a maturity-based program. Much like we wouldn't advocate you have an under nines strength conditioning program, I wouldn't say that you should have a pre-peak height velocity strength conditioning program. Yeah, because ultimately, for us, the thing that is, uh, is the key ingredient is what you see in front of you you know, the competency that that athlete demonstrates. But the growth and maturation stuff is a really important ingredient as well. And there's many ingredients that will go into that pot that we probably think of and view. Some are, are very conscious, some are subconscious. But, you know, I think it, we should never lose sight of the fact that this is a people industry and it's what about, you know, how we coach what we see in front of us. It's, it's absolutely critical. Um, but it's really good to have that, that awareness of what's happening from a, a natural development perspective. This is something that we've pulled together for some resources in terms of how we go about assessing that competency. So, 
you know, can a kid find a position? Can they hold a position? Can they go in and out of position a number of times? And then what happens if you actually make the, the exercise more complex and more challenging? And along the way, it might be that cueing solves poor movement, but if it doesn't, we have to be creative and we change the exercise. Yeah. And for us, in terms of a practical applications point of view, this is what we try and hit within um, our training programs with our younger athletes. This is not rocket science. This does not require any research to do this. It's a, more of a coaching philosophy. We try and make sure that these aspects are within the program somewhere, okay? Um, it might be that certain individuals need a greater focus, but I think when we get in the early, um, or the novice kids into our program, and I, I, may, I make point of a novice there, not early maturing or pre-PHV, so you could have a, an under 16 year old who's never trained before, um, and you know, we would sort of have much more of a broader focus on them before we start getting more specific and more tailored. So just to finish with uh, tragic dad here, but you know, developmentally appropriate, are we asking kids to do 1RMs? No, even though there is some data on uh, five year olds around 1RM leg press that was uh, safe, no injuries reported. Um, you know, we would sort of say that a lot of our work with the inexperienced athletes would be body weight type conditioning. Yeah, not to say that when we start to get more advanced, the exercises become more challenging. We try and increase the load that we're placing on these athletes to make the exercises more demanding. Because we know all the research is telling us that we need to get to a point where we actually start to introduce some sort of external load. Yeah, to try and get that response. And you know, these are kids, so this is a, a girl who's 15, I think at this point, who'd um, been uh, within the training program for a good sort of five to six years. And Tom Matthews is her coach, done a fantastic job, really good coach, um, and has built her up over time, you know, that slow cook process. And then I just wanted to finish with this really, uh, in terms of, this is an example of, of some of the resources because quite often we say, we'll do this sort of, um, uh, discussion or have this talk and people say I haven't got the I can't do that I haven't got that type of facility um, but I think at a grassroots level if we're going to try and make these introductions then you know we pulled some resources together for Welsh Athletics where a lot of it we can do and we can sneak it into the start of training program of um, uh, skill sessions you know those sort of 15 20 minute windows that we get and there are definitely certain things in terms of building off a basic curricula that we can actually drive forward and I don't want us to forget that coaching is at the heart of this, okay? Um, this kid is not really engaged. Um, and, you know, from a, a pedagogical standpoint, there's no point in us knowing all this stuff about pediatric exercise science if we can't actually work with kids. Okay, so, um, you know, please, uh, you know, at the end of this talk, this is a, a blend between understanding the science but being able to apply it um, is probably a bit of an art form. So my final three, the, um, what has our research shown and, and uh, others, I would say that strength and skill are really important. I think uh, they should be a focus and a, sta a central pillar. Um, we need to start as early as we possibly can. Um, and if kids are able to, if they're old enough to play sport, I would argue they're old enough to do some form of, uh, of preparatory conditioning. And we need to make it challenging and fun. So even in our most serious youth sport programs, we need to remember, as I said at the start, that these are kids at the end of the day, okay? And they should be the focal point of any program, um, you know, and, and making sure that, that their priorities are about enjoying that sport and staying in that sport for as, as long as we possibly can. Um, just to, to finish with, just again, a huge thanks to Ben and, and Kev. Um, privilege to come here and it's a privilege to speak to so many of you. Um, I'd, uh, I'd better thank my own place. Um, so thanks to Cardiff Met. And then these are probably my main um, people that I've collaborated with over the years. Uh, and, and I've recognized standing here that in these photos I am holding a beer in every single one of them, which probably counts against my character. But um, those, those guys have really, um, you know, formed a lot of our research moving forwards. And um, uh, Paul, Avery, Greg, and John are, um, are actually you know, pioneers in the field. So a huge thanks to them. Thanks for listening.
Okay, because it's my responsibility to keep us on time, uh, we've got probably one, uh, one question, one quick question for Rodri. If not, I've got one. The other side of the room, Van. <laughs> Uh, morning. My name morning. is Nolan. I'm a sports yeah. student. Going back to the 11-year-old um, table tennis athlete in the Commonwealth Games, I did watch one of the matches. Do you think it's a case the actual opponent would see that child as a um, serious competition? Sorry, I didn't quite hear the, the back end of the question. Just again. Would you think the opponent would see an 11-year-old okay. child as serious competition or so? by the um, team as well, where that child could actually feel left out. Yeah, I think I get it. I mean, the, probably something that wasn't emphasized uh, just the time we had, the, the psychosocial aspect of all this, and it's, it's probably one of the major untapped areas of, of um, I guess, long-term athletic development type research is, you know, how, we, how kids experience these changes going from childhood through to adolescence, the impact that has on their, their psychosocial type qualities. Um, so I'd probably point in the direction of Sean Cummin from University of Bath, who's done, his background is actually psych um, and, and growth and maturation, which is very unusual. You don't, there's not a huge amount of, of those sorts of scholars. And um, he's done some work around biobanding and the effects of early maturing players playing against um, um, maturity matched peers, sorry, as opposed to playing in age groups. Um, and the data shows that the younger or the less mature kids actually felt they had more of a chance when they were playing against similar sized players. And the older kids actually found that they were having more of a challenge. So um, the, the specific case of the table tennis player, I'm not too sure. Um, but in terms of published data, uh, I, I do think that is something that, that needs to be considered. And I, I think people have jumped on the, ba the biobanding work and, and people say, well, hang on, it's, it's now nothing to do with age group play. It's all about biobanding. And actually, if you speak to Sean, he doesn't suggest that. Um, he will suggest, you know, the age group stuff, there, there's, there's a certain quality to that in terms of playing with peers from the, you know, the year that you're in school with. But having periodic exposures to the biobanding type tournaments gives a probably a, a, a fair indication across talent ID and, and talent development. Cool. I think, like I said, uh, push for time. So we'll uh, thank you very much, Rodri. Round of applause. Thanks. Thanks.